Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Hello and welcome to your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jarrah Stays, and I don't even know what month it is. On today's show, we'll talk about some bad behavior online. Catholic Mass is returning next week. The next chapter for some art van furniture stores is here. We'll get nerdy about something called FOIA and Flower Day at Eastern Market will look a bit different this year. Plus, how you can help clean up the Rouge River while practicing social distancing from your own home. And Cheyenne Nosserini joins us to talk about what we're missing nearly two months into this quarantine. We'll get right into it right after we thank our members on Patreon who make this show possible. Your support is crucial in pushing Metro Detroit's conversation forward and sharing our local stories. So consider joining us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. And thank you. Big story this week in the Metro Times, Jer. Reporter Steve Neveling gained access to four private Facebook groups where dozens of members made threats of violence against Governor Gretchen Whitmer over her policies regarding the coronavirus. Commenters talked about assassinating the governor, beating her, dragging her into the street. Uh, it was awful. Uh, these comments were clearly in violation of Facebook's own policies, and they come ahead of yet another planned armed rally at the Capitol building in Lansing on Thursday. GOP leaders condemned the comments, and Facebook has reportedly taken action in removing some of the groups and users from its platform. Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky told the Freep that anyone threatening anyone with a firearm should be arrested, but he came up short of calling for a ban on bringing guns inside the Capitol building. The Michigan Capitol Commission met Monday to discuss that very issue, but they had to cut the meeting short after people cut into the teleconference, issuing threats against members and lawmakers. Jer, this is turning into uh, like an alarming and dangerous situation quickly. This is getting to be crazy town. And not that it wasn't before, but it's another level and another level. It's, to me, what I don't understand. Well, actually, I do understand because it's politically calculated, right? There was this thing where Republicans said before that meeting you just talked about, we that they don't that the Capitol Commission does not need to make this decision, all this other stuff. But let me remind the leadership of the House and Senate that this power does rest in their hands. They could ban guns in their own chambers, but they choose not to. Attorney General Dana Nessel told them they have the uh, authority to to ban guns inside the building, the Capitol building. So when it comes to judging people, you really need to look at how they act and not what they say. And it's really clear that although they condemn this violence, their actions say that they endorse it because otherwise they would have taken action on this thing. And we talked about this uh, last week with people that this is just unheard of behavior. But that's where America's at right now is unheard of behavior. And another thing that I wanted to, to come out with, with this, you know, I guess you could call it hate book, if you will, is that there is this like concerning trend for me. And you know me, Sven, I'm a policy wonk. I love debating issues. I love debating when's the right time to do things, different, mm -hmm. you know, ways we could approach an issue. But if you go for anything that describes like Whitler, Hitler, Whitmer, any of that stuff, I'm sorry, that's just gross in yeah, my opinion. Yep. Look, you either don't know your history or you're going to belittle some folks that had some real atrocities done to them. Why? Because Hitler committed mass genocide. And we keep forgetting that. Folks are just throwing this stuff around like it's easy and bringing that back. That's not OK. And whether you agree with Whitmer's policies or not, you know, we can have that debate. But once you get into Whitler and going into this discussion from this place of just hatred just it's just gross well bring, bringing guns to these rallies uh does nothing to lend your argument any credibility i'm sorry but you you just basically completely undercut your your entire position because there's no need to be bringing assault rifles to the capitol building to a rally protesting the quarantine you know this is not armed thugs keeping you at home this is a public health emergency and yes it's difficult and we can we can argue about the the merits of it and everything but uh bringing guns to it i'm sorry you you lost your position you lost your credibility 
Well, Sven, one of Detroit's biggest retail names was Art Van for many years, all the way back through our childhood and beyond. But the name isn't staying. However, some of the stores are. 27 of the stores, with 17 in Michigan, are going to be part of a new company called Love's Furniture that will be based in Royal Oak. And the new company is actually owned by a guy named Jeff Love, so I kind of I kind of appreciate the name. There's like a kitsch to the localness of naming the company after the person. You know, it feels like straight out of like a local TV commercial that would be in Detroiters. Sort of like Art Van. (laughs) (laughs) U.S. Realty picked up the stores for just under seven million bucks, according to court filings. They plan on hiring about a thousand employees. And in southeast Michigan, they'll have stores in Royal Oak, Livonia, Warren, Waterford, Westland, Shelby Township and Taylor. The company says that there will be a soft launch in the next few weeks. And I'm going to assume that's going to be pretty flexible considering everything that's going on with the coronavirus out there. I think what's really interesting and, and you know, I'm not putting this on uh, Jeff Love or his new furniture chain that, that he's trying to get off the ground. But I think it was really interesting. Matt Friedman talked about it in a recent episode that um, the closure of Art Van was bad enough just in the sense that, you know, it's leaving all these empty buildings and uh, unemployed workers in its wake, but it was also a huge blow to the local media uh, right before the coronavirus lent them like, you know, a knockout punch. You know what I mean? Because Art Van was, you referenced the TV commercials that we all grew up seeing, a huge, huge advertiser in the local media and, or their their, their, uh, missing presence is being acutely felt, I mean. In other news, the Archdiocese of Detroit announced Tuesday that they are restarting public masses optionally Next Tuesday, the 19th, they'll be mandatory for parishes on May 29th. That'll be a day after the current stay-at-home order runs out. There are some guidelines for this. The church needs to run at 25% capacity. People need to be six feet apart. Wear masks, except for the priest and ministers who are doing the celebration. And, you know, what's else interesting under this, Sven, is that funerals, weddings, and baptisms are all on under if they follow these guidelines. But Sunday attendance for actual parishioners is not required for the faithful through the beginning of September. So this is kind of interesting, Jer. Um, I mean, there. I think this is a big assumption. First of all, that May 29th uh, is going to be all clear. You know, we still don't really know that. I mean, I'm, I'm right there with them. That I hope that it is the case, but we don't know, and we can't make assumptions. And you know, we're still operating without, you know, a solid plan. Uh, there's been little to no federal guidance on all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, you and I, you pointed me to the, the recent episode on the weeds podcast with Matthew Iglesias and, uh, Ezra Klein talking all about that federal response or lack thereof. And, and, and just the, the void that it's left and just the way that we're just kind of rushing headlong toward this conflict between, it's stay at home quarantine that's been devastating to the economy and opening up the economy with no recognition that there are a lot of things, you know, that other countries like South Korea and Germany. And I just read an interesting story about Denmark, uh, you know, that they've done in order to kind of reopen safely and, and stay very careful and, and on top of things, monitoring the virus and outbreaks and contact tracing and all of those sort of things, which you see virtually none of here. Sven, I wanted to talk to you about this one because it it piqued my interest, especially considering your journalistic background. And it's about FOIA requests. The New York Times editorial board had a piece called, No, Your FOIA Request Cannot Wait Until This Emergency Is Over. And Michigan has a checkered history with FOIA requests. I want to talk first, like, what is a FOIA request and and why does it matter? So... FOIA stands for Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so FOIA request is essentially that you're invoking a federal law. I think it was signed by Lyndon Johnson, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And, you know, it's it's sort of considered now kind of part and parcel of the First Amendment freedom of the press uh, right, you know, and also with transparent government, uh, government and, you know, the right of the public to know what their government is up to. So it's, it's essentially where you can invoke a law, uh, to request public records that the government may not be, uh, or may or may not be, uh, forthcoming about, uh, releasing. And it's, and it, it requires governments to, uh, to release those, those 
records to whoever's whoever's requesting. I mean, this is something it's typically used by uh, members of the the news media, but it's something anybody, frankly, can can use. I mean, an average citizen can can uh, file a Freedom of Information Act request. And part of the problem is that the act is is interpreted very differently uh, in different states. What they highlight is that uh, Pennsylvania and Hawaii governors have advised their agencies that they don't have to abide until the offices return to normal function. And then the piece also singled out our own Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who has given agencies leeway in how they comply with requests. Layer on top of that is that there are some exemptions in Michigan for a lot of elected officials. Yeah, Michigan does not have a great record on Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, the legislature and governor's office have long had like an exemption carved out from it, which is which is weird. There's been a lot of talk, especially in recent years, a lot of effort um, to change that with some legislation introduced, but it's never gotten through uh, both chambers of the legislature. Um, Governor Whitmer last month issued an order. It didn't get a whole lot of attention, but it suspended parts of the FOIA law if it interferes with the state's coronavirus efforts, including Whitmer's stay-at-home order, of course. Um, and it, uh, you know, the Whitmer's Whitmer's order holds as long as the public body deems necessary, or until the emergency her emergency order expires on June fifth. I understand the challenges that are presented by the coronavirus quarantine. You know, if you're going to file a FOIA request, uh, presumably some of these documents, you know, may not exist electronically and would require somebody to go into offices that are closed or, or buildings that are closed uh, because of the of the stay at home order. Um, but you know, it can't become an excuse to steal off the government from the people. Um, you know, so it's 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 a tough issue, but um, you know, it's definitely a slippery slope that I think the New York Times is right to point out. Well, Sven, as you know, pretty much everything has changed thanks to the coronavirus. There are so many things that uh, we used to take for granted that just aren't here right now. I've noticed, and one of them is going to be Eastern Market's long-standing tradition of Flower Day. That's usually the Sunday after Mother's Day, and it can bring up to a hundred thousand people to greater downtown Detroit. And it's such a magical and and fun event, but obviously it's not going to happen in person this year. So what they're going to do is an online ordering platform that's set to launch in about two weeks on May 24th. What you'll be able to do is pre-order, then pick up a few days later at the market, and there will be streams for three weekends to highlight local growers, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's obviously not the same, but, well, frankly, is anything. And, you know, at least we're doing something. Yeah, at least we're doing something. I mean, I think uh, they'll still get some business. I think people, I think one of the effects of the stay-at-home quarantine is, I, I don't know about you, Jared, but I've seen so many people out working in their gardens, in their yards and everything. And I think... Uh, maybe a silver lining here that we're going to see some really beautiful, you know, private gardens and people's homes and stuff this year, because I mean, frankly, people have more time and they're looking for things to do to get out of the house, number one, but also just be productive and, and put their, you know, uh, channel their, their energies and their anxieties towards something good. And I think, uh, flowers and, and trees and landscaping and things is going to be one thing that, uh, is, you know, sort of a beneficiary. The 34th annual Rouge Rescue is coming up this Saturday, that May 16th, but with public gatherings still prohibited because of the coronavirus outbreak, the annual river cleanup and restoration effort is going to look a little bit different this year. Cindy Ross is the restoration manager for the nonprofit group Friends of the Rouge River, and she joins us now via Squadcast. Cindy, welcome to Daily Detroit. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. In previous years, Friends of the Rouge River has organized river cleanup and you know planting of native wildflowers and trees at you know dozens of sites all around the Rouge watershed. This year, you're going online. Can you explain what you're doing and how it's going to work? Rouge Rescue is one of the largest river cleanup events in our state, if not the nation. And we didn't want to lose that excitement and enthusiasm. And with the COVID crisis, we quickly adapted and created this online platform. So we're really excited to be able to bring some opportunities to people 
across the region. And we created some fun and simple things that people can do right from their home or even from their computer. So what would be some examples of options that you're giving people to do? Well, in sticking with the tradition of Rouge Rescue, our our hope and goal is to have people get out, especially on the date that the annual event normally occurred, which was Saturday, May 16th, and do what we always do. Pick up trash from along the waterways or in your neighborhood, maybe a little pocket park in your community. Help us clean up the trash that's been, you know, accumulating over the winter season. Mm -hmm. Other things, a lot of our volunteers are pretty familiar with pulling invasive garlic mustard plant. And if you have experience and you're familiar with that, we ask you to go out and just tackle some garlic mustard. If you don't want to leave the comfort of your home, uh, we have some fun things for kids to learn and do. We have coloring pages of some native wildflowers. And just other little sort of games that kids can partake in online. Even something like plant a tree that helps us to manage stormwater, which is one of the biggest sources of pollution in the Rouge River today. Hmm. And I noticed that you can choose three different programs or wildlife monikers or whatever, and you're also awarding points, right? That's right. So part of the fun of ramping up this online Rouge Rescue and to engage people early on was to ask them what their mascot ought to be. And so from an online polling, we selected the dragonfly, team redwing blackbird, and team frogs and toads. And they all are very much in line with the work that we're doing and dependent on the river for their health and well-being. And it's just a fun way to sort of create a friendly online competition. And then uh, with the points, I assume uh, what you're giving out, a uh, person with the most points gets a cookie or something or, or what? Many of us are walking around with Fitbits on our wrists, right? And when you hit a certain number of steps, you get a little a little badge. So something similar to that, we have little badges for, for the tasks that you can complete. So we have six different campaigns by taking a walk or cleaning up or learning at home. You can earn different badges as you go. This is the 34th annual Rouge Rescue event. Why is it necessary or important, I guess, to, you know, do this year after year? I mean, what are the conditions like that you find down in the Rouge River? Well, historically, when Rouge Rescue began in 1986, the headlines for the Rouge River were really grim. The headlines were, the river is dead. Is it even possible to bring it back? And, you know, the photos were of this, you know, cesspool almost image of our river. And I'm really happy to say that after 33 years of volunteers being engaged and actively cleaning up and caring for the river, we have had a dramatic shift in how the river looks and how people think of the river. The river really has become such a, an amenity. It's where we recreate here in Southeast Michigan. We have our our parks and, you know, trails for hiking and now developing a water trail. So people are, are actively connecting to the river in a positive way, where in the past it was really not so positive. And I thank Rouge Rescue and Friends of the Rouge for the decades of cleaning it up. It's made a real, real impact in this region. Yeah. We'll be sure to put a link to the website for more information where people can sign up in the show notes. Cindy Ross, Restoration Manager with the Friends of the Rouge River. Thanks so much for coming on Daily Detroit. Thank you. So guys, I've been thinking lately about things that I am just craving, right? I mean, we've all been cooped up now for what, almost two months now going on. I think, you know, we're all getting a little bit stir crazy. We're missing the ability to do things that we used to do, go places. You know, we've had nowhere to go. And Cheyenne, I know you and I have both kind of been dealt a couple personal setbacks in our our family lives here uh, the last uh, 24 hours or so. There's one thing that I keep coming back to. Uh, It's not a constant thing, but it's something that keeps popping up to me, and that is donuts. Yes. Today on your Daily Detroit, Sven wants donuts. Well, so I'm not like the biggest donut eater in the world. I mean, I don't eat them every day. I don't eat them every week or anything, but I do every once in a while like a donut. And I like certain kinds of donuts. Like I like donut shops. I, you know, I've heard 
somebody say that, uh, in fact, I think it was Jer, that uh, Krispy Kreme remains open. I was actually just out there by the Oakland Mall on Sunday and went right past that store. So I probably could have gotten some. But I like going to like the small business places, like the little like, you know, mom and pop stores and all the ones around me that I usually like to go to because I love their donuts are, as far as I can tell, closed. Dutch Girl's closed. Apple Fritter here in Ferndale is closed. So all of my favorite, you know, neighborhood donut purveyors are closed. And man, I'm just dying for like a good glazed donut right now or like a, a cruller, like a blueberry cruller from Dutch Girl or something like that. Like, you know, it's like all those little things that we depend on right now to kind of get us through and prick us up and I can't have me any donut right now and it's giving me the sads you know sven i think i might have an answer for you sir what's up through the friend grapevine there might be some doughy salvation for you and that could come in the form of a new donut spot uh -huh. that is actually near where we both used to live on the east side jefferson chalmers neighborhood called yellow light donuts oh. and that's at the corner of marlboro and east jefferson so far east side a bit away from where you're at not too bad for me but I think, sir, we're going to have to try it because at least as of last week, they are now doing donuts you can order. You can order them a half dozen at a time. And inside their orders, it actually comes with a fixed variety of donuts. And I'm very excited to have something like that over on the east side. And it's a local business just getting their feet. I like the idea of some local donuts. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely excited to hear that. I hope that they can ride out this interruption of the coronavirus. But yes, good to hear that there's a new independent donutery in town. The other, you know, the other like uh, thing I will add onto this is like, Jerry, you spoke with Jackie Victor from Avalon Breads mm. the other day. Avalon makes a fantastic cinnamon roll. It's not technically a donut, but you know, pretty close, but their, their cinnamon rolls over there are wonderful. And I've also been craving something like that. Just, just like sweet, sticky, you know, with the sugary glaze on it. Like, oh man, I'm, it's making me hungry right now. Just talking about it. If you want a cinnamon roll, I do know that for the love of sugar down in the Scott, right off of Woodward, mm -hmm. she has cinnamon rolls and she also has cookie butter cinnamon rolls as well. Like mm. if you want to go a little bit different, you can also get one of those, but they look delicious on Instagram. And if you're craving a cinnamon roll, that's where you can get one. I, I see your donut and I'm going to raise you an apple fritter. Oh yeah. Well, that would work too. Cause the fritter is a unique thing into itself, especially when there's little bits of apple inside of it. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Meanwhile, what are you guys craving? Like, what do you guys keep coming back to? Like you wish you could have and can't right now. Sapino pizza straight up. I can get pizza. Mm -hmm. But I can't get Spino. One of the finer uh, slices of pie in, in the whole region. Mm -hmm. And it's got so much variety to it. Yes, you could do your standard pepperoni or whatever. But then there's this uh, Mediterranean or, or Greek pizza I've had before that has like feta and olives, which I'm not usually an olive guy, but these are really good. Miss it greatly. Onion. I miss all of that greatly. And there's something about those kind of pizza spots. You just cannot re replicate it home with a home oven. Fantastic thin crust dough, uh, nice and yeasty, chewy flavor. I love it. Yeah, great. Cheyenne, what about you? What are you craving? What am I craving? I am craving Warlow's nachos. Warlow's from over there on Hilton in Ferndale. Yes, little hole in the wall bar. My friend Holly works there and their nachos are amazing and they are made with Doritos. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they are so good. What else do they put on them? Like, because you can buy Doritos at the store, shy. You can't. I know we've tried to replicate it at home, but I don't know. It's not the same. It's like trying to replicate a Reese's peanut butter cup. It just doesn't really work. It's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. It doesn't have the same magic. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's because it's Holly. I don't know. But you can either do ground beef or chicken. We usually do ground beef. It's got like your usual nacho toppings, lettuce, tomato green pepper, onions, cheese, lots and lots of cheese. Processed cheese or like actual or grated cheese? Grated shredded cheese. It's not like the processed nacho cheese sauce. Yeah. No, it's not cheese sauce. It's real cheese that gets like melty all over mm -hmm. the chips. And then the magic part is because they cook it in their pizza oven. Some of the outer chips kind of get a little bit burnt a little bit. And so it gives it a nice little flavor. It's delicious. I love it and I miss it. What are you guys missing out there? Hit us up at dailydetroit at gmail.com and maybe we'll read your answers on the air. Hmm. 
And we're done for today. Thanks so much for listening to your Daily Detroit. For Julius the Podcat, I'm Sven Gustafson. And the dogs, Raina and Gabby, I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll get through this together. Talk with you soon.